Good afternoon. <coughs> and welcome to the session Israel in the year 2020. We refer to it as uh, the plot thickens. I'm Liran Antebi, and I investigate the future battlefield, and I am always tempted to see what other people think of the future, and I have done the same uh, this time. Within this session, we're going to deal with Israel in five years' time, and I'd like to call the participants. I'm going to introduce them. Within uh, INSS activity, we make sure that to deal with broadening the spectrum, meaning dealing with the various issues regarding national security in its broader context, uh, both hard and soft power, not only military power, but additional um, factors that are in the picture. You could see several such issues on the slide just behind me. And in this session today, we're going to try and deal with various issues that are enveloping the security influencing it and supporting it. We're going to, I'm going to be joined by a group of talented journalists. I'll introduce each and every one of them. And they had a mission. They were not very easy to accept this mission. And they also made sure that they corrected me and alter this mission until everyone felt comfortable and agreed upon it. And the mission was to write a piece from the future, something that is going to reach the year 2020, and try to um, imagine whether it is a utopia or a dysutopia, and we're going to see what each and every one decided to write. They wrote article about different topics. They selected the topics themselves, and each and every one brings here uh, from their own uh, mind, thoughts, and ideas. We're going uh, to hear... Uh, journalists and bloggers. The first one who will be speak is Tal Schneider. She's a journalist and she's a political uh, blogger. She has a blog, plug, the political blog she used to write for uh, Washington. She's also a lawyer by education and she writes a lot about Israeli politics, politics and gender, relations of Israel and the United States. Her articles appear in a variety of uh, places like Globes, Mako and Ma'ariv and she also won the Journalist Prize for 2012. Shields going to talk about her topic, the, the one she's selected. Then we're going to hear from Shaul Amsterdamski. He writes for Kalkalist. Uh, his uh, writing revolves around uh, pension, middle class, uh, education system, many topics that uh, regard us all. He speaks in many media programs on a f regular basis, and he also won the Sokolov Prize for 2013. He's also an operative blogger. Uh, his blog is called Think Tasty. It's going to be tasty. Then we're going to hear from Yair Kraus, the Energy website, and Makori Shono's paper. He lives in the north in Kiryat Shmona, has edited uh, a lot and wrote a lot. He is the winner of the Efrat Prize for Environmental writing he basically talks about uh, peripheral areas in Israel and last but not least is Esther Rieder. She is an ultra-orthodox publicist and journalist. She used to write and uh, fill many positions in the ultra-orthodox media as well as a political column. She's now uh, studying for her master's degree in uh, governance and she's one of the leaders of for the voicing of women's uh, women's voice in the ultra orthodox society, and now I'm going to allow each and every one of the speakers to uh, talk about their selected topic because I'm also responsible for the times they're going to adhere to the timetable, and later on we're going to see if we can also interview the journalists themselves. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me to talk here. Just like a good column, I'm going to start uh, talking about myself, although the definition was talking about the future, but I explained to Liran that journalists 
find it very difficult to deal with the uh, future, the far future, at least as I know it for myself. In 1991, when I was recruited to the army, I wanted to have uh, to be a combat soldier, but the possibility of uh, being uh, in the pilot course never occurred to me. I never thought that this was an option, not because I couldn't perform it, but rather because the Army never allowed it to happen. And so I did uh, the closest uh, possible thing as far as I was concerned, and I served as an instructor, and then uh, I went uh, on to another job. Several years after my release from the Army, I heard about the Alice Miller um, Court of Appeal uh, resolution, and the first thing that came to mind is, how come I didn't think about it myself? Uh, turning to the court so that it could be part of this uh, course, my thought was quite limited in the Army. I never thought this was an option, and I was certain I have to do only what the Army enables me to do. And Alice Miller, uh, I'm sure that you're all familiar with the name and the history of this appeal to the uh, Court of Appeals. She simply opened uh, one's mind. And this uh, penetrated, just like the military uh, court that people are familiar with, the, the, just like the saying goes in the army, there's nothing like one cannot do, but maybe one does not want to do. I think that maybe it is possible, but uh, the army doesn't really want women. I looked at the figures. I know there has been a great shift since my time in the army service. But still, when Liran asked what we wish to see in 2020, I said that in 2020, I wish to see the Army, the IDF, uh, having more women in leading roles, and not only on the paper, but really as the military that wants women to be in its lines. Many things have changed since I was a soldier and an officer. We now have uh, soldiers, uh, women that are in combat, uh, units and technology, but uh, the change that had occurred in the area of technology, it should have been more evident that women should be in a better place because obviously combat field is not only in the front, even the military uh, combat unit as far as uh, armament, as far as logistics or ballistics, etc. things are being operated from afar. And how come we don't see a more thorough influence gender-wise? I understand that in the formal dry definitions of the army, over 90% of military professions are open to women, but in the in reality, only half, 50% uh, are incorporating women, and even these 50%, the incorporation of women is very low, and it is quite obvious uh, saying that in the reality of Israeli society, where the promotion and the connections that you take from your uh, military service uh, is dependent on what your, uh, you have done in your army. It is an asset, and your entrance ticket, even in the, c in the civilian uh, world, has to do with uh, commanding, has to do with leading a staff, and the, as long as the army does not initiate and and urges women and encourages women, it is harming itself and it's also harming 50% of the population. I would like to see a broader view, not only towards women uh, such as myself, but also towards uh, women, whether they're religious, ultra-orthodox, all sorts of women, and not just uh, relating to him as a gender or s a certain sector. The character of Israeli society, of course, obliges equal opportunities to all its citizens, and so in a place where women are fighting for equality in other areas, and I'm writing a lot about the political arena where women are fighting for equality, we're familiar with it from other places in the world. It's not enough uh, formally only to open the lines and say uh, it is open and then be so surprised how come women do not want it, and it seems at times that they don't uh, wish for it. In 2020, in 2020, I dream of being at the point where the army really is speaking more clearly to women. Not only are you invited because it's open, but I want to hear from the army that he needs women, that he needs them. Hello and welcome. I'm happy you asked me over. My name is Shaul and I'm a calculist. In the last summer, so journalists have said that they are first of all identified by being Jews or Israelis and only then to be journalists. 
So if I were to say that, first of all, I'm defined by having two young children. The oldest will be five on Saturday, and the other is one year and nine months old. And ever since they were born, I find myself writing more and more in Kalkalist about issues that have to do with the f- their future in the country that we live in. And I wanted to talk today about one of the issues that rarely rises in public discourse or in the media, and that is something that really is one of the most boring issues. It really is burdened with figures and statistical terminology and seems completely disconnected from the here and now, but in fact is very much uh, so. I want to talk about demographics. Let's say about the demographic threat that we heard about in terms, uh, when I was a child, in terms of the Palestinian and Jewish um, population, but a different demographic threat. You probably didn't notice, but in 2010, Israel crossed a watershed uh, threshold. I don't want to give you too many uh, data, but everything I've said, uh, everything I'm going to say today is backed up by uh, research from the Bank of uh, Israel and other places, but something happened in 2010. Since 2010, the growth rate of people in the working ages has gone down. The number of people who are in working ages goes up, but at a slower pace than in any other year. And it's because we're all getting older. Israel is getting older. And unlike what we always think, it's not because people are living longer, it's because of my mother's and father's generation who were born post-World War II, the baby boom. And just like they came into this world at the same time, all of them, a lot of people, they are all now retiring together. And if now the rate of dependency, which is something that... uh, Uh, describes the number of people who are working who need to support the number of people who are retired so if now it's four people who have to support one person who's retired soon it's going to be three people on each pensioner and that might sound good in many countries in Europe it's two to one so it looks like they have a better, a worse problem. But in Israel, it's different. Because in Israel, aside from the fact that within two decades, we're going to have twice as many older people, people who are older than 65. Sorry, I'm calling them elderly. That's just the way they, uh, they are uh, um, described in terminology. We are also a very young country. And children, there's something about them. They don't work. They don't support the economy. So this layer that is in the working ages and has to support those who have retired on the one hand and those who have not even entered the labor market in the, on the other hand is b- waning and thinning out. And we have to do something about that. Because if we do nothing about that, our standard of living and the standard of living of my generation and certainly the standard of living of my children may be... Uh, we come to detrimental home. And I remember in the last decade that the growth rate of the Israeli economy was four, even more percent per year. But this year and last year we're talking about three and a half percent. And inter alia it has to do with this. It has to do with the potential, our potential, how many people we have that can actually go out and work. That potential has gone down. In order not to sound fatalistic and deterministic, we have to do so many things in order to have more people go into the labor market. And in order to have a lot of people go into the labor market and hopefully at enough wages so that they can pay taxes and can actually add to the GDP, we have to do two things. And these things are very hard to do politically. We need to put in vast amounts in the ultra-Orthodox sector and we need to put in vast amounts in the Arab sector because these two sectors can effectively are effectively misrepresented or underrepresented in the labor market for various reasons and this is the time to do it because we may very well be, uh, at, uh, be facing a lost decade because those children who are already in the education system it's very difficult to catch them. What we need is we need the government to put in vast vast resources, and without public pressure, very few politicians will voluntarily do so. Thank you very much.
Hello and good afternoon. Yair Kraus is my name. I come from Kiryat Shmona. Like many journalists, I think that what makes us unique in the periphery up north and down south is our mission. We understand that it is our role to pre represent and to symbolize everything that is in the periphery. And therefore, thank you for being allowing me to be here and making my voice heard. As for my uh, title, we're talking about Israel 2020. Yesterday, uh, incidentally, uh, has to do with the panel and the issue at hand, the uh, experimental oil drillings have begun in the Golan Heights. An American company and, and IEI think there is a sweet point in, Golan, in the Golan Heights, a lot of that black gold, the most significant natural resource, liquid oil, and they are now trying to see whether they are correct, whether there are indeed tens of billions of barrels that can supply Israel for the next 60 years is indeed the Golan Heights the right place. And this is already under debate between the green organizations, the uh, environmental organizations, uh, the locals and the other companies and the state of Israel who see a lot of value in oil. And in the, something I wrote, it's very difficult to predict the future, but when I was asked to predict the future or to determine what will be the title, I decided not to determine what from the side, but to give the sides of the argument of what I suppose we will be talking about, having understood that if I talk about 2020, then maybe it's, we should be talking about now and maybe not wait for 2020 because then it'll be too late after they do or don't find this oil because once they do, it'll be very difficult to say why we shouldn't uh, um, pump it out. Otherwise, because uh, in the understanding that we can understand uh, the that we can become a uh, superpower and we can actually we won't be have dependent on Saudi Arabia and ISIS and uh, the other sort of uh, places that uh, we need to get oil from and I I and affect the companies that are leading these drilling that are heading these drillings that have begun as I've said yesterday is that Israel re really needs oil we need 275 barrels per day which we are using and we assume that within a few years we will need uh, quite a few more and this uh, c should be able to give us 250 billion barrels that will allow for huge profits to Israel. We know the Shashinsky committee that said 50 to 60 percent of the profit should go to the state that will go to funds that will help welfare and education and not just security like most budgets seem to do so the state will be better off and will benefit but there is also a price the price may be a huge one and catastrophical and the environmental organizations are saying they're going to protest and rally 10,000 people also those living in the Golan Heights and non-green organizations will be protesting against this and trying to prevent this oil from being pumped out of the ground because it may uh, cause huge damage to the Kinneret, to our water resources. Remember the Avrona disaster, what happened when an oil pipeline blew up and what happened to Avrona, to that nature reserve, and what such a similar disaster could happen uh, at the uh, uh, proximity of the only sweet water reserve we have, the Kinneret. And the entire world, the Sea of Galilee, uh, and uh, we all know that uh, green energy and the use of natural gas and how important it is for Israel to be a uh, green energy superpower. And Israel is doing everything it can in order to find this contaminating uh, oil that is harming us, that is... Uh, um, that is uh, promoting illnesses and uh, all sorts of contaminations. We are also hearing reports that by 2020, maybe we'll know real headlines. There are tanks and airlines and hybrid aircraft, hybrid tanks. It may be utopia, but this reality is very worrying. And you know what? One last question that is being asked. How will the periphery benefit from this? 
from the, will these prophets go to the Jerusalem people, to the people in central Israel? Will they decide where to allocate these resources? Will the funds also go to the American company and the investors who are investing $80 million? Will they be getting the profits? And will the Golan Heights, the people living there, who will be a, 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 a drilling rig instead of a tourist attraction, what will the Golan Heights look like? And will the people in the periphery will actually enjoy the wealth that the state of Israel will be enjoying? There are many questions, and it needs to be discussed now, because in five years' time, once they decide, it'll be too late to grapple with it. Today. Thank you. Hello. Unlike the previous speakers, it was not difficult for me at all to foresee the future for the simple reason that I currently live in the future. I am working in the present but for the future, and for the future I hope not of my grandchildren but rather of my nieces. Since the campaign started, not I'm going to... Uh, no voice, no vote. This is the uh, title itself. I'm using the pact. I'm uh, getting assistance from uh, the prophetess uh, Devorah, from Sarah Schneer, from other biblical images, uh, from the first feminist uh, fighter who um, established the Beit Yaakov movement. I'm uh, comforting myself that at least I don't have to fight as did the suffragists in the in the beginning of the earliest uh, in in the early 20th century. So I have many many stories of uh, heroism, but what I need is a time machine, a time machine that will show me the end of this fight. And this conference is some sort of a virtual time machine. And through the article that I wrote, I could examine first and foremost with myself how much do I believe in the battle that has been the main axis of my life in the recent weeks, and then see how relevant this struggle is not only for the society in which I live, my community, and the ultra-Orthodox sector, but uh, generally speaking to the entire Israeli society. So, yes, I do believe that we're going to see an ultra-Orthodox woman parliament member in the Israeli parliament. We see now in the midst of our campaign that this is a possibility. I believe we're going to have an ultra-Orthodox woman in the Israeli parliament because people uh, cannot believe now that uh, women didn't have a right to vote in the past. And so I believe that the fact that ultra-Orthodox women will be able to be parliament members in an ultra-Orthodox political party is a possibility, and I'm working for that. Such a parliament member is not only a must for the ultra-Orthodox community, as far as I see it, is fighting for Israeli democracy. Each and every day where there is a party that, is, that does not include women is a very big question mark for the level of democracy of Israeli parliament. And each and every day where legislation for representing women does not occur and is not promoted because there is not enough members of the parliament who are committed is a shame. So the time machine I was supplied uh, by uh, through the session was very uh, nice to me. I find a reality and I found space for the entire society. The older orthodox society went from being sectorial to show broad responsibility. We see Rachel Ibenboim and I uh, have foreseen that she's going to be the parliament member. She understands that one cannot uh, be shut off in your own walls. You have to be part of the larger society. One of the climaxes of hypocrisy is that of the transparent people of Shas. Shas in her regulation does not this include women, but just, it simply does not let women appear. Has anybody seen Adina Bar Shalom uh, here in the round? Arya Derry had a woman. He could have put her in his political party, but despite that fact, had he put her in his party, he could have looked directly at the camera and 
and look about the transparent people. But Arya Derry does not blink when he talks to the camera about discrimination, and he simply excludes women. We saw in a satirical program, Eretz Nehederet, uh, something very nice yesterday. Yes, we do have women in our party, but they are transparent, so you cannot see them. So for the traditional and the East and the uh, women, he says, yes, yes, we're going to have a woman as a parliament member. But in the interviews for the Orthodox media, he says, no, this is completely against our uh, belief. My vision is completely different. The woman parliament member is different. Tal Ohana is a social activist. She, Gali Sambira, is also uh, a lesbian who is a social activist, and they work together with member of the Knesset that is an ultra-orthodox. This is one other reason uh, women from Eastern origin, uh, lesbians, ultra-orthodox. I have to stop uh, shortly, but I do see uh, through my time machine another beautiful landscape that telling us that the Arab society is a bridge for regional development. And I wrote this even before uh, the last political changes. Uda Abu Baid, she nowadays deals in an organization promoting the health of Bedouin women. But in my vision, she's going to be an entrepreneur of social economy development. She's going to build a high-tech greenhouse. They're going to work together with the Jordanian University. And so we have another stage of the social um, future. So thank you very much for traveling my time machine for a sustainable future, democratic one of cooperation, of vision, of hope. And right now in the present, we do not give any support to political parties who don't support women. We don't believe those who talk about transparent people, not including women. And we do not back a democratic, so to speak, parliament that does not allow women to work within it. And we do everything in order to promote legislation in this matter. Thank you. We're back in the present then, and thank you all for uh, traveling and taking us to the future. And the questions are going to focus actually uh, in the present. What should we do now in order for uh, this to happen? I'm going to direct several questions to you personally, and then a general uh, question to all. Shaul, let's start with you. We cannot ignore the fact that we are now in the time of elections, and uh, recently you put in your Calcalist website a very nice project. You turn to the various candidates and ask them about their uh, vision as far as the economy goes. Uh, did anyone uh, give you any answers back, or can you see anything in their policy? Did any one of the candidates uh, set itself up for this lost generation you were talking about? No. Well, great. Politicians, not only in Israel, but worldwide, has a whole system of incentives that operates them for the short term and almost solely for the short term. In states like Israel, where elections are held less than every four years usually, the incentives are really, really for the short term. And we're talking about a problem that's going to be uh, very, very problematic in 15 years' time. Uh, this uh, goes together with other areas like the health system and the pension system and the nursing system. They're all going to suffer from a, a shortage of budgets when population grows older. This is nothing that we can cut, can cut the ribbon of right now. And so political parties who even bother relating to the issues of economy, those who uh, do bother solely relate to uh, the present issues, that of housing, cost of living. The demographic bomb is very, very difficult to dismantle. I'm not familiar with any sane politician who would like to put their head into this uh, a sick bed. So what is the opportunity, what is the chance that we're going to see in the next uh, government uh, uh, government that takes care of our future? Well, one little thing occurred uh, in the outgoing uh, Israeli parliament. Professor Eugene Kendall put it on the table of Israeli government, just like uh, they get a survey of the security threats. Uh, this is the first threat that uh, economically wise that he presented. And he called the government to start uh, thinking of a strategy in this direction. The government started 
doing something, I have to explain what so you understand how little they did. There are many, many problems and issues with this issue of demography, and the government decided that it will start with the issue of taxation and a little bit of occupation of uh, people who are across the 60-year-old uh, threshold. Uh, there was a commitment that was uh, established in the Ministry of Senior Citizens under Minister Uri Orbach, who passed away yesterday, and we can understand how much attention the government gave to it, and the Ministry of um, Finance said that has to release the money, how much attention did it provide to this issue? Ultimately, this committee uh, thought about several recommendations. It uh, gave its recommendations to the government. The government did not accept it. And this was supposed to be the initial phase in the long way of dealing with this issue. So without public pressure, I don't have any optimism in this regard. You all surprised me because you got the opportunity of writing something optimistic or more pessimistic, and you all uh, provided headlines that are quite optimistic and successful. You didn't choose to a uh, report of any catastrophe that occurred. I see that you're not as optimistic about things really happening now because you're talking about uh, incorporating different populations. I'm going to talk to you to ask you, Esti. You're now working. Uh, in social issues, but particularly amongst ultra-Orthodox women within the campaign. The question is, how, to what extent would women from the ultra-Orthodox society wish to become part of uh, the work uh, circle? Do you see that this can be successful as far as the ultra-Orthodox uh, society goes? I don't think they really want to be involved in the political side. This is somewhere I see a difficulty, but they do want to be involved in the labor market, of course, and they are already in the labor market, and that is exactly the biggest problem of the ultra-Orthodox women and one of the reasons why they should be represented in the Knesset, because they work, but the Indian and the Chinese they are the slaves, uh, the Indians and Chinese, so to speak, of society. They work, but they uh, have less than a minimum salary because they want to preserve an ultra-Orthodox lifestyle. They want to work in an ultra-Orthodox environment. And they have all sorts of uh, private contracts that uh, are not uh, being respected and fulfilled. So, of course, the costs in an ultra-Orthodox household are different, but there are many more children, and the ultra-Orthodox women deserve, once they are already working, to be earning uh, proper wages. And we are now talking about having ultra-Orthodox men integrated into the labor market, and it's really a big question that every employer should, call, should ask him or herself. How open are you to having ultra-Orthodox men and women working in their business, not uh, to pray and leave, but to work, to sit down? How open are you uh, to having it happen? I don't think there's a problem with it. I always chose to live by secular people. I think that we can only learn from one another, but uh, maybe I'm not representative of the ultra-Orthodox in this uh, area. And I think that Israeli society should also think long and hard and see how open it is to this integration that uh, you are waiting for it to happen. And when they do go out to work, do we actually give them proper wages or do we actually give them minimum wages that doesn't uh, support them? Don't you think that maybe we should start from the other way around, from the other end, maybe integrate all the ultra-Orthodox in the labor market and then maybe have reforms within the parties take place by themselves because of their adjacency to the secular society? Reforms in the parties won't take place by themselves. They unfortunately won't also take place because of me or due to me uh, or because of my friends. They will only take place if the state of Israel will help and legislate in this manner. That's the only way that a political reform can take place. And I think that the social reform is happening. It is taking place. Ultra-Orthodox women are not what we think they are. And ultra-Orthodox men also, they go out, they are working. And there, too, we need fair legislation. 
And maybe we need a woman who is a member of Knesset and doesn't only think of sectorial ultra-Orthodox needs, but also about overall Israeli society and social responsibility. Okay, so Tal, let's go back to you. In light of your work, you uh, attend political conventions. I see your activity on Facebook. And many times you come out with the anecdotes from these conventions. How many women do we see there? Is it working? Well, first of all, I would first like to, to agree to what Esti said and a change in legislation that is almost impossible. I think that for the last 20 years, female members of Knesset are trying to legislate, but every time it fails. And it's amazing. The number of members of Knesset, female members of Knesset, is going up. The last time it was 27, and if the forecasts were correctly, there'll be 30 in the next Knesset. And yet, in order to legislate a law that very preliminarily uh, deals with the uh, representation of women in the ultra-Orthodox society. Uh, it's very complex. So I really want to uh, take my hat off to these women, chapeau to them. Uh, as for uh, these political events, it really is a very masculine event. There are very few women. It changes. There is a range, a wide range. Uh, there's Meretz, who are left-wing, there's like half-half, and the Labour Party, who have really come a long way. Uh, but then you get to an event with Ayman Uda, the head of the joint Arab list, uh, where there were 200 men and I was the only woman, and I didn't even have anything to do with it, I was only covering it. And in the Likud Party, there is a huge shortage of women, it's very prominent because it's a democratic party and they're liberal and so forth and to see them uh, as opposed to the uh, Labour Party. But what's amazing is what's happening in the religious Zionist movement where we thought it was a conservative society and unequal, but it's not true. They have activists who are female. They have uh, those working in the primary elections who are female. They also have uh, female uh, politicians who have a clout. And uh, in other societies that are perhaps more conservative, like the ultra-Orthodox, you can see the difference, the gap, in the way that women are treated and what they are expected, what is expected of them. And um, they are actually demanding even so it's a process that I think is quite new to them as well. But as I've said, when you look at the Knesset in general, because there are 18 seats in the outgoing Knesset that were barred uh, to women because of Shas, Yehadut HaTorah, and Ra'am Tal, the Arab uh, uh, party headed by Ahmed Tibi, well, he, is not head, he doesn't head it, uh, he says the speaker. Uh, he is part of it. it. They are barred to women only because they are women. And this barrier is something that is just, uh, it's blocked. Uh, the other parties need to compensate, so to speak, by two-thirds in order to, uh, to uh, balance things out. And that is, of course, uh, not a legitimate demand. I just want to say about uh, women in the national religious society is that the only two MKs that did not sign the law from Rav Micheli were Ritzstruck and Shuli Brandt. So, Shuli Mualim. Well, we can't affect their opinions, but the fact that they are there and that they are leaders, it's important. Well, I want to take you to the article you wrote, the forecast you wanted to unveil, and you talked about the impact that will come through integrating women in the army. And I thought that we have ended the age of generals in politics, and now we have the age, we're in the age of journalists and reporters in the uh, media, in the pol in politics. So there are more female journalists. So why are we back to the army? Well, we're not just talking about promoting women in politics. In all systems, if you look at local authorities or the public sector, or the director generals of ministries in the government and the pub private sector as well. The training and what the army gives you really is a um, g allows men to leap forward. We have 250 local authorities in Israel. Uh, only three are women, or maybe four. That is a horrible percentage. The same is true for members of uh, local councils. And when you come out of the army, that is the infrastructure. That is where a lot of the manpower comes from to many other positions in society. And it's also true 
for directors of companies, businesses. We see it everywhere. So I think that uh, maybe uh, maybe the only place we don't see it specifically is in the court or in the uh, advocacy and in the um, Ministry of Justice. But otherwise, we see very few women in the managerial ranks. And for instance, you really need to want it in order to make a change. A huge change was done in terms of the, the boards of directors in uh, companies, and people were worried about what would happen if women were to take over boards of directors. Well, everything worked out. It's absolutely perfect. And if you asked before about the, pla about the um, platforms of the uh, parties, so when you look at gender, we see leaders in other countries, such as the prime minister in Japan, when he presents the uh, the um, budget or the financial plan, he calls it women 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 nomics, because they know that if the uh, labor market does not use the infrastructure needed, because in Israel, in terms of planning and policy, in the army and in other places. We don't say we were we want formal equality because you're good, you're working, you're indigenous. Uh, because the politics needs it. Local authorities, where they're dealing with uh, in, with uh, education and sewage, uh, they also need this diverse thinking that allows everyone to take part. Yes, indeed. And we'd now like to move back to the periphery. And you, Yair, have proposed a headline that perhaps will solve all of our financial problems. But whether uh, whether oil is found or not, perhaps it won't be pumped out in Israel. Mostly if it's not found, obviously. And then how do you see the periphery in the future? Because the periphery is already in a difficult situation financially. Do you think that this forecast that won't actually be realized may lead to pessimism and will lead people to leave the periphery? Well, I think that even if they do find oil, I'm not sure the periphery will actually get to enjoy it. The budget, the resources, all the export, all this production usually goes to the government, to royalties, and not really to the to investing in the periphery. And what I'm worried about is that those who will be working in these drilling points will be the uh, workers. Uh, it's the easiest thing is to get these poor people working with their yellow helmets to drill out the oil in the periphery, as we know from industrial zones. So there's the, is the center of Israel, the Tel Aviv area, and Jerusalem area, and then everyone around them, they drill out the oil, but all the profits go out to the USA, to the investors, or to the government. And I'm not sure if this uh, forecast is uh, uh, egotistically uh, positive, that I will actually benefit from it as a member of the periphery. How would you recommend uh, the residents of the periphery to en enjoy such uh, an agreement or such uh, an occurrence? I would... Uh, allow them the benefits, even without finding oil. I expect that in 2020, even if oil is not struck, I do hope to see a work plan where periphery is meaningful, where it is, uh, resources are invested, and the, not necessarily roads. Roads are being developed, and we see it on a daily basis. Even when we come here, we see that roads are being built. Inter but still, there is a great distance beyond the physical distance. There's a mental distance, understanding when ministers and, the, and parliament members that we don't see in the peripheral areas in the years, they only come to launch new projects and they come and they go. I expect more. I think that the issue of oil and the question of how do we want to see Israel in 2020 uh, as far as green energy, as far as the uh, concern of the periphery, these are questions that should be asked even not regarding this trigger, what do we do with billions of uh, dollars that are going to come into our um, hands if we strike oil? 
What are we going to do with this money? I think that even if we don't have these billions that the state would uh, receive in several years, these questions should be asked, questions of distances, of periphery, of proper investment. And when we talk about uh, promoting uh, various uh, segments of the population, the periphery is a question, is an issue, a very meaningful issue of discussion in all these respects. One last question, which is going to be uh, open for all of you, and you're uh, more than welcome uh, to talk amongst yourself about it. What is a step or up to three first steps of policy in light of the issues you raised that you think the next government must uh, operate in so that we do see your articles being written in the future time? Let's start with USD. Unfortunately, uh, first and foremost, I have to see that they don't oppose it when they negotiate on uh, establishing a coalition. This is a room full of people, and it's on TV, and we don't really discuss this issue. But, unfortunately, we have to fear that the old orthodox political parties will put this as a condition in the coalition negotiation, and if it was buried for 20 years, it's going to be buried. I hope you didn't give them an idea right now. Unfortunately, I think that they thought about it without me. But we saw that uh, they managed to pass, uh, the, for first calling, the Israel Ayom, uh, Bill, uh, it really upset the Prime Minister. So if you really wish it and you have, if you have people committed, things can be done. This is what I can do and I want to do in my campaign. And so I'm turning to the secular people as well. Today I'm talking in Jerusalem, uh, I'm talking to Jerusalem to ultra Orthodox men and this is being done very harshly. I uh, partake in all sorts of stages like as this one. I want it to be not politically correct, to be a shame not to support ultra-Orthodox women. I mentioned to women who are not supportive, I want it to be trivial, to be uh, evident that you support this law. You simply would not agree to have this as a condition. I think that this is the basic um, basic premise that can help my issue. Thank you, Yael. If women are complaining, I wish to complain as well. I'm not complaining. But in the next uh, government, I think there are only three representatives from the Galilee area. Uh, it is such a large portion of uh, Israel. It is so necessary as far as Israeli decisions are concerned. And uh, it is not represented in politics. And if you're asking for these three bullet points, the things that the government should um, think of is really specifying what are the most acute important issues that bring about the great gaps between periphery and the center, whether it is welfare, occupation, education, all of these we see huge gaps, whether it is education, uh, talking about classrooms, teachers, assistants, health in the periphery, in the Galilee, morbidity is higher. If it is occupation, we don't see occupation, high tech, there are no catalysts of power, catalysts that would push and or pull a population to these areas. I think that we have to come with clean hands and understand that we can definitely cut the ribbon. We can definitely have a work plan and up and and make sure that it we follow it through. Haifa uh, is not that much of a north, I'm sorry. But I think I think that uh, the more representation the north uh, part of Israel has in the government, it's going to uh, be more in uh, the government's mind. The uh, government has to understand that uh, periphery, just like the United States, you can travel from one state to the other, to another, or go to work and travel for more than an hour. I think that this is critical on the verge of the elections and the verge of a new government. And of course, the periphery has a great meaning as far as security policy goes. These people are uh, absolutely living uh, on our borders, and we cannot do without them. And I'm really, uh, I'm going to connect it, and I will remind uh, us all that we are here in the conference of uh, national security, and this has to do with national security regarding education, resilience, and economy. 
Shaul, perhaps what you said is the most uh, disturbing because Israeli market can definitely uh, topple down. There is no chance of being able to continue holding the IDF and security systems without enough taxpayers. We simply have no money. It's not going to come from anywhere else unless we want to completely suffocate all civil budgets. I would connect to Esti's idea regarding coalition agreements. I would love to see their declarations of an intent for a five-year plan for a in massive investment in these two sectors. It's true that in the ultra-Orthodox there are things that are starting particularly in the women's side of the picture. And when they go off to work, they don't always have the skills that are necessary, and usually their pay is very, very low. I would be very happy if ultra-Orthodox politicians, if they are part of the next coalition, would stress this and not uh, the enlargement of uh, children's uh, pay. I think that if they internalize the fact that their society is changing, they would uh, also make the change. Another thing that can be done with the ultra-Orthodox uh, society uh, is uh, looking at the Arab sector. I don't understand how we resolve the issue of the Arab sector women. I would like to see a vi uh, deputy minister of education who is Arab. I would like to see someone there in the Ministry of Education who is minded towards this topic. Nowadays, education budgets are discriminating the students in the Arab sector up to 75% in budgets. When we talk about high schools, the weakest students from the weakest sectors receive 75% less budgets than the Jewish sector. Without anyone specifically uh, minding this, without people sitting in the Ministry of Finance in the Budget Department, I think this, such a change would be very difficult. So last but not least, in the last uh, days of the 33rd government, this last government, the end of uh, December or the beginning of January, the government passed a resolution of implementing gender uh, programs in the ministry, something that uh, they had for a long, long time ago. They could have voted on it. This was nothing that could really be enforced, but it was some sort of a declaration. And when you ask me what do I expect from the next government, I would want the next government to simply take the rules and laws of the State of Israel and implement it when it is uh, establishing a committee. Each and every time they establish a committee without women, then we have an appeal from a women's, orga women's organization and they fix the situation. We have things that exist. We have a work plan for the IDF, and I think that many public uh, entities in Israel should have gender-oriented programs. We all see what's happening now in the police force. I don't think that a gender uh, plan would resolve the issue in five minutes, but we cannot look at things uh, just in, say, uh, in the context of one government. But we have to make sure that the next commissioner in the, of the police, whoever he is, we we'll have to have a broader view and not just stitch things very coarsely. We must know that the police force, the army, and the government offices need this creativity, need, need this workforce. And I truly feel that as far as the coalition negotiations, this is something that uh, fortunately is, uh, we already understand it is essential. We just need the will to want to implement the rules, uh, apart from the orthodox, orthodox and the Arab sectors, as we have heard, where the problems are more complex and they need uh, continuous legislation. I do hope that in the coalition negotiations, it will not be canceled to begin with. Okay, so we dealt with social incorporation, uh, incorporation in the workforce, economy, and security. I think that it is very obvious that uh, we have to deal with these issues, and I hope the next government understands it. And thank you for the train travel, and thank you for coming back in time for lunch or uh, for our next break. Thank you.